I'm Ephraim K. Smith, a professor of history at California State University, Fresno. In 1996, I was traveling down a country road east of St. John's, Michigan, when I came across what I thought was the ruins of an abandoned residence. It turned out to be an historic mint still. I'm grateful to members of the Crosby family for helping me understand the history of the mint industry and how mint is planted, harvested, and stilled. I'm Jim Crosby. I'm a fourth generation mint grower in St. John's, Michigan. Our family has been growing and producing mint essential oils for the last 88 years. We are very pleased to be working with Dr. Ephraim Smith on this short segment. The attached video shows the history of the mint industry in St. John's, Michigan, with a particular emphasis upon the history of the Crosby family. We hope you enjoy this short video, a segment from the forthcoming American Mint documentary. I think uh, American agriculture in general is getting um, probably farther and farther removed and less appreciated. Uh, less than 2% of our population today is uh, agriculturally based. I don't think most Americans are aware how their lives are touched by any kind of agriculture. Uh, <laughs> and I think even the mint, even, even maybe a little bit more so because it's a, a processed crop. Uh, you don't see it coming into the store like you see apples or blueberries or, or, or any other kind of fruit or potatoes, uh, even peas. It's just, it's just kind of a, a flavor that's in a pack of gum that's in toothpaste. I think every morning you get up and brush your teeth, there's some form of mint oil in that toothpaste. Uh, every time you buy a stick of chewing gum or a piece of candy that is probably flavored with some form of uh, our essential oils. And uh, so it, it is usually very interesting to anybody. And I've never run into anybody that just said, oh, yeah, OK. <laughs> you know, they, they right away want to know how it's raised. This isn't the right shovel. I'm just destroying the crop here. This is typical mint plant. Uh, the roots are real shallow, actually they only grow about four inches into the ground. You see a lot of rhizomes here that are growing. This is a good healthy plant that's got lots of little uh, hair roots on it. Uh, the mint spreads with these stolons. They grow along the ground and eventually these will put out roots and grow another uh, stock of mint. Okay, there are three different uh, varieties of mint grown in this country. Uh, peppermint. Uh, Scotch spearmint and native spearmint. Uh, the, the peppermint varieties are the ones that are a darker variety. Both the spearmint varieties are a lighter green, have a little smaller leaf, and uh, they stand up uh, more than uh, the peppermint. The peppermint one it actually reaches a height of um, five feet tall, but to look at it in the field after it's lodged, it uh, is more like a foot, 18 inches high. John, what kind of mint is this? Well, there's two commercial varieties or strains of mint that is produced in the United States. One is spearmint and the other is peppermint. This is peppermint. It's a little bit darker uh, in color. It has the, it basically is the same plant other than it does produce a peppermint type oil. And the oil is produced in oil glands that are found on the backside of the leaf. And if you can look at it carefully, you can see it glistening. And yes, that's, I heard that it glistens. It shows that the, the oil glands are filling with oil. When I look across the countryside looking for a peppermint field, I look for the darkest green field. That usually will be the peppermint field. Uh, as you can see at the apex here, we have a terminal bud that's starting to come out. And as you get around 5% bloom, these will be pink blooms. That usually is a good indication that it's uh, about the time to harvest. In the plant, there are certain components that the oil users, buyers, and the Wrigley's and the Colgate's like to have in their oil. And it's about that period where we've found over the years that uh, maturity is when you have about 5% bloom in the field. And we'll be probably harvesting this field in about another 10 days. 
because we'll cut this mint, let it dry for, oh, two, no more than three days, and we'll start raking it up and chopping it. Mint is harvested like hay. Uh, it's mowed, and then it's uh, raked into rows. Don, what are you driving back there? It's a uh, Massey Ferguson wind roar that we use for cutting of the uh, peppermint and spearmint, Ephraim. And how does it work? Uh, well, basically what it does is it uh, cuts in a swath of about uh, 60 inches wide. And what it does is it cuts a path of mint, uh, lays it down, and it prepares it for drying, and then we chop it. And then it is allowed to dry or cure there. And then it is uh, picked up by mechanical means and transferred to field tanks which today are mounted on the beds of trucks. And these tanks bring the mint to the distillery, where it's hooked up to a steam source provided from a boiler. The uh, steam percolates through the load, and is uh, the oil-laden steam passes overhead to a water-cooled condenser, which liquefies the steam. And the oil uh, is separated in a separator. Uh, and drawn off as it as the product. Well, we're in the process of distilling peppermint today. Uh, we've run about 10 loads so far, and we have about three more to, before the day's over. So uh, we're having a pretty good year this year, uh, besides the uh, rain that hit us, but uh, we're do getting along pretty well. We get paid when the buyer decides he needs some oil, and that might be this year. This year or next year, depending. So normally it's at the end of every season when we get done. The, the growers, the, the handlers and processors, and the end users are, are, are well connected together to, to produce a, a quality product at the end of the day. It starts at the farm, uh, where the farmer raises the crop and then from the crop distills the oil. At that stage, uh, the dealers step in, uh, handle the oil, and take it to their facilities for processing. We call, I call our, ourselves mint dealers uh, in certain uh, areas of the trade, such as the MIRC and the Far West Spearmint Marketing Order. I believe they call us mint handlers. A handler purchases oil from the farmers and uh, formulates the oil to the specifications of the customers on the other end of the market that we do business with, primarily end users who manufacture products that uh, the consumer might recognize in the stores, but also we sell to flavor houses, another segment of the industry that uh, the flavor houses in turn uh, put together flavor compounds for smaller companies. From a quality standpoint, we're there to provide the first line of quality control for a raw material that comes from the farm. As a mint dealer, or my colleagues uh, would be say the same, I'm sure, is that they're not in the business of deciding which is the best mint. The best mint is what your customer wants. What he wants, though, is consistent quality. He wants it uh, to be the same uh, character from drum to drum, from year to year, so that he can put it in his product with some assurance of uh, consistency. We buy the oil from the farmers in 55 gallon drums. Uh, then it's taken into our uh, warehouse uh, in each of the locations out west or here in the Midwest we bring it into this location here at Center Street. Uh, the sample is sent to our agreement facility here where we uh, check that oil on three different uh, uh, chemical analysis. That oil then uh, is trucked back here uh, to our Bremen location or possibly our Niles location. We know exactly which drums we want to put into which blends uh, and we'll sort the oil out and then we will do a uh, preliminary blend of all the oils. Right here we have our blending operation. Uh, our foreman here, uh, Todd Garberson, is in the process of blending uh, oil into this large 40 drum vat. Uh, he's pumping oil uh, out of these 55-gallon drums, uh, which contains a quantity of 400 pounds each, uh, through a series of filters into this large 40-drum uh, vat. 
uh, we let that uh, set for a period of a few hours, uh, and then we will uh, continue then to pump that over into uh, a, another series of drums, which is the final blend of the particular lot that we are uh, putting together for a customer. The process of how we blend min oils uh, at the Liebermuth Company, or M. Brown and Sons, uh, through a system of piping. Right now they're putting together a blend for, uh, for one of our customers where they'll blend you know, two or three different origins of, of domestic peppermint and, uh, and fill it and ship it uh, to these folks. American farmers produce the highest quality product, in my opinion. Um, I think that it's the opinion of uh, uh, most of the people in the industry that we produce the highest quality peppermint oil. Otherwise, we wouldn't be growing it. Other people can grow it a lot cheaper. The U.S. industry really bases itself today on its quality, which is, is the premium quality product in the world. This mineral is used as a flavoring, primarily in two categories, which use over 90% of it. Most of the time that people, at least as I've talked with them, are, are really surprised when you tell them that uh, the vast quantity of this oil, and we're talking about more than 90%, are used in two basic products. And, and those include the obvious one, which most people would think of immediately, and that's chewing gum and other confectioneries. Um, but the other major usage, of course, are in, the, in toothpaste, dentifrice, and dental products. Chewing gum is very popular in America, especially. The vast consuming public, we hope, uh, will continue to have a love affair with mint. Mint, after all, works very well in a lot of products. If you can think of uh, a better flavor to put in your mouth to start the day, let me know. Because to me, there's something wonderful about a peppermint or spearmint flavor in the morning. It's fresh. Uh, this is probably one of the most widely accepted flavors uh, of, amongst people. And the other important thing is that it's a flavor that they don't tire of. Mint has, has a connection to, to a health, to a digestive uh, character. Well, as a family, we always thought peppermint oil could help with digestion. Uh, it's a carminative. And just a little drop on a toothpick uh, in your mouth is wonderful. It just relieves every little distress you have. You know that if you have a little cut or a scrape on your hand, peppermint oil is wonderful. Well, tell us about that. What, what do you do with peppermint oil? <laughs> Other than just flavorings with candies and that type uh, of thing, but you, I you use it. you have a scratch on your hand? You oh, definitely. Uh, the children, yeah. that's how our children were raised. So we didn't use yeah. a lot of Neosporum and that type of thing. We used You never use a Band-Aid. You just go get a, get a bottle of peppermint and dip the little uh, uh, Q-tip on it and put it on there. and. It, it dries it up and it's, it's, it's it gone. It's got, it has menthol yeah, in it. No? A little. It stings a little. It, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to get it near your eye. Uh, and then there are other uses like aromatherapy, growing in interest because after all, mint has been forever a, a wonderful uh, treatment for the skin and for uh, deep massaging. It, it's, uh, it's that bright mentholic uh, effect. And then a teaspoonful uh, in, a in a cup of water to make a, a hot water, to make a, a, s a steamer if you have kind of a stuffy head or a cold, and rub it on your chest if you have a cough or something. And all those fumes would work up through your head and uh, just give you great relief. Now these are home remedies. They're not for publication for a real doctor's prescription or anything. Today, uh, you see peppermint and spearmint oil and, and menthol and uh, byproducts of menthol uh, being used in all kinds of different applications. Uh, we have people who um, are manufacturing um, insect repellents with the terpenes from peppermint and spearmint oil. Uh, we have people who uh, are, are using uh, peppermint oil uh, for aromatherapy. Uh, as, as, as a way to enhance uh, their lives.
I think the U.S. mint farmers are unique in the sense that they both have to be good farmers, but they have to be good at the distillation of the, the crop to produce the oil as well, which are two entirely separate and unique skills. Mint is grown in the United States in two areas. The Midwest, which would include the states of Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, and South Dakota, with the center of production located in the Pacific Northwest, which would include the states of Washington, which leads the world in spearmint production, Oregon, which leads the world in peppermint production, Idaho, and to some extent, Montana. The mints as a group uh, have long been cultivated uh, uh, by earliest man, presumably, as cultivation began because of their obvious pleasant essences and then uh, for their medicinal values and were brought to this country by the early settlers and primarily uh, as medicinals. There were several varieties of wild mint you know, f that were found in North America. But the kind we're talking about were probably imported as roots or rootstock or maybe seeds, although mints are very difficult to propagate by seeds, brought in by early colonists because those early colonists, you know, brought in all types of seeds and rootstock and so forth. The use of mint in those days was about entirely pharmaceutical and uh, uh, continued that way really until the uh, almost the turn of the century when such items as uh, uh, toothpaste uh, and chewing gum came along. Well, in the late 19th century, the market began to change significantly. Most of the peppermint and spearmint oil grown before that was used in, uh, uh, you know, for medicinal purposes. Largely, uh, a lot of it was exported to different pharmacy companies and pharmaceuticals. But in the late 19th century, along came people like William Wrigley, and. Uh, figured out a way that he could get chicle and spearmint to be compatible in chewing gum. So you got a different flavor of chewing gum. And it very quickly became a nation's top seller. And uh, Wrigley, of course, recognized that uh, if he was going to continue this enterprise, that he would have to have quality products, and which is still the hallmark uh, today that chewing gum manufacturers stick to very high quality peppermint and spearmint oils. The second major change was the introduction of spearmint into uh, toothpaste, high quality, you know, flavoring in toothpaste. So, by the teens and twenties, American mint farmers could count on a growing domestic market for their peppermint and spearmint oils. In increasing numbers, Americans were chewing mint flavored gum, enjoying mint flavored candies, and brushing their teeth with mint flavored toothpaste. The use of peppermint and spearmint oil in chewing gum and toothpaste was a significant market boost for the mint industry. Since mint traditionally produced higher yields on lands free of weeds, insect pest, and crop diseases, this new demand for high quality oil helped fuel a migration westward to new lands. In Michigan in the 19th century, the initial plantings had been on what were known as burr oak openings where nearby oak trees sheltered the tender mint plants from wind damage. Very quickly, however, Michigan and Indiana mint farmers, many of them using a new plant variety promoted by A.M. Todd, known as Black Mitchum, realized that the rich black soil of drain ponds and swamps were ideal for mint cultivation. A.M. Todd had established his mentha plantation on lands northwest of Kalamazoo, Michigan. Todd and his manager, Richard F. Stroud, planted willows as windbreaks to protect the mint plants. By 1917, mint farmers in southwest Michigan and northern Indiana were producing most of the nation's mint oil. Starting in the teens, but particularly during the 1920s, however, mint cultivation spread westward into south-central Michigan. The area around St. John's was destined to become the most important mint producing region in the state. One of the most significant developments in this area occurred in the early teens when J.E. Crosby purchased land south of St. John's from Charles Sprague. So that was quite an operation early back then. We loved it. 
It was, it, was a, it was a lot of fun. My grandfather arrived in Michigan in about 1911 or 1912. And uh, originally he uh, owned and operated a dairy farm just outside of Dayton, Ohio. And he bought some property east of here that was muck land. And uh, he was going to raise cattle on it. And uh, in the meantime, he discovered that there was two acres of peppermint on that property and, and uh, nobody had ever done anything with it. They'd, I don't know where the roots came from. And uh, so he harvested that year and, and uh, they loaded it into the barn. They brought it up and put it in the barn and let it sit there till all winter. In the spring, they took it up to uh, Carson City where there was a mint distill, peppermint distill. And uh, they had it distilled up there and then they come back and it was fairly lucrative so he started to uh, break up the ground and get it ready for more mint. So he gradually proceeded to put in more acres and, and uh, developed into probably 150 acres of, of mint, which was quite a lot for that time. So this uh, building here is the second, second uh, uh, still that would be here. The first one was uh, made out of an old locomotive and uh, upright condensers and so forth. And, just a small one tub with a small boiler and, and uh, everything done by hand, of course, at that time. Somewhere in the 1920s, early, early 20s, why he built this still. And then soon after that, why everybody in the area was uh, into the mint business. Uh, it was probably, uh, I would guess in Clinton County, uh, 25 or 30 mint stills that went up shortly after that. This still belonged to my grandfather and grandmother, Arthur and Hattie Vale, and it was built in the early 20s. When they distilled the mint the first year, they had one barrel, which was 400 pounds. I can remember walking from their grandpa and grandma's house back here and watch them drain uh, the oil. It, uh, it was a happy time. I remember Pauline's dad telling me about the first crop they had. It was, I think they only had a few acres in, and uh, but it turned out real good. It had over uh, 400 pounds, which is excellent, excellent for the amount of acreage. And of course, the price was high, so they're all pretty excited over the amount of money they had. We call it distillation, and, it, and in, in the true physical sense, it, it really, you're not truly distilling per se, but rather by means of steam, you are able to volatilize the oil from the surface of the plant by means of the, of the increase in temperature, volatilize the oil in a, in a vapor phase, and then by cooling the vapor, and you're cooling both the steam and the oil. Once it's cooled and back to a liquid phase, then the two separate, the oil separates from the water, and it makes it very easy to recover. You certainly have to have still or, or the ability to find a still nearby uh, to distill the oil. Uh, you can't have mineral oil without a still. The, the plastic uh, uh, still, uh, uh, consists of, first of all, a steam source, which means a, a, br a, a boiler. Uh, and uh, again, these are typically, in the early days, they were coal-fired, even wood-fired, uh, but uh, subsequently then, with, with other petroleum-based fuels, uh, uh, like oil or natural gas. But so there's a, a boiler, uh, a receptacle, uh, which essentially the Gore uh, refers to as a, as a tub, uh, in which the uh, mint uh, hay or material is placed. Uh, that, that tub has to be fitted with steam lines, which permits the steam then to course through uh, the mint hay. Uh, it's then conducted uh, into a cooling uh, structure, which is referred to as a condenser, and it's a water-cooled structure, which permits then uh, uh, to reduce the volatile uh, uh, steam and oil to back to liquid uh, by cooling. 
That subsequently then is conducted into uh, uh, a separation tank, uh, so-called separators, uh, which permits the oil and water to physically separate and the oil coming to the top, and then it, it can be recovered then in that particular container. If you just uh, pitched in a long hay, it would just take a few forkfuls to fill your tank up. But if you st uh, had three or four guys in there tramping, then would what we call put the steam to it, well, you could put an unheard of amount of hay in if you just kept tramping. You got about half full, and well, then you had three, four uh, kids, uh, we call them trampers, that would get inside and just keep tramping it down with, with their weight. And of course, you'd like to get the biggest and the fattest, heaviest kids in the bunch. And, and, and all while you're doing that, well, the steam would be coming up from the bottom of the mint tub up through the uh, hay. And of course, with tramping and packing, you got a lot more in. All the guys that, that were in high school that I sort of followed in football, they came out and worked for dad. And, there's, and I can see them now. They, in the round tubs, they would get in there and stomp that down as they'd pitch it in. And they'd tromp it down. And they'd put their arms around each other and, you know, around, and just jump up and down, you know, just take it down. We used to, uh, when we get up toward the top, we'd reach down, reach on the side, see how far the steam was coming up in it, and boy, we'd uh, have to jump out and get the cover on just before the steam come up through. Oh yes, we always had fun. Uh, always working with a group of people, and uh, it was just, you know, you visit as you work. Up until about 1940, most mint was loaded with a uh, horse-drawn hay loader. Uh, it was loose, long-stemmed hay placed on the wagons and then brought into the uh, distillery building and pitched off with a pitchfork into the vats. Well, that was negated when they then went to a chopper system uh, where uh, the uh, uh, hay was, was mowed in, into a windrow and, and then they brought the chopper directly. And, and this is simply a modified silage chopper the same sort of chopper that they would use for making silage uh, in, in which the hay was simply chopped in and then elevated directly into the tub. That precluded the necessity then for, for further tromping because that settled more uniformly and you could get a lot more of their hay or herbage into a tub. In 1948, we were the first ones in this area to have the tanks and uh, word spread around and uh, we had a continuous uh, flow of visitors over at the old still on 27. They just come in to see what it was like and uh, after that, the, the next year, why everybody was switching over to the same thing. So my dad was one of the pioneers that started it and I think he got probably got the idea from Clyde Anderson too because Clyde was uh, operating in Emily City at that time and then he'd been out to the west coast and seen a lot of their operations, so that was the first year that the mint was chopped, of course, with a, with a hay chopper, and that was, a, that was a big move, too. And you still had to stomp because uh, as the chopper, the chopper came in then, and it elevated it up into the tub, but you had to have men in there spreading it out and tramping it down to get a big load on. The tops were removed. Most of the tops hung in the distillery, uh, so we, we pulled around a, uh, an open top tub, uh, the material was dropped in from the top and then pitched around with pitchforks and, and tromped manually and then the tubs brought into the still and the, the lids uh, lowered and uh, uh, sealed a lot like you would on a pressure cooker uh, canning. Well the next innovation then was to go to, to rectangular closed tubs in which the opening was on the end of, of the tub. And uh, the, again, the hay was chopped and blown directly uh, into that unit. Larger capacity, uh, closed top, made more efficient uh, uh, distillation or volatilization of the oil. And the process essentially was the same, simply the, the shape and, and type of tub that could be taken directly into the field and, and filled in that way. In the years I've been in business, the biggest change, I think, was coming from uh, 
the open tanks on the truck where you tromped them in, in and then brought it to the distillery to the enclosed tanks that we have today, uh, which uh, cut down on a lot of labor uh, and has made a neat, neater operation as far as I can, can see. Each of these are, are unique Des uniquely designed structures adapted for this process and because of the fact that that this is a relatively small industry most of these are are custom built or built on the farm uh, so they vary in design somewhat they vary in terms of the needs for the grower well we have three stalls here at, uh, we can run three tanks at a time and uh, three separate condensers that uh, that the uh, steam run, runs into. So most of the stills today, the, this is sort of a primitive still. <laughs> today, uh, most people have uh, a lot more stalls. Maybe they'll have eight stalls and, and uh, 300 horse boilers. But this, this boiler is probably uh, about a 100 horse boiler. And we have two boilers and uh, connected together. So it was put up, like I said, in 1968 by Clyde, Clyde uh, Anderson. Hilda, uh, J. E. Crosby has has spoken of uh, of your father with uh, reverence. And he seems to have had yeah. quite a reputation. I don't know how they got along without him, because it to me I was rather jealous because he was never home between July and August during the mint stilling time because things would break down and he'd have to be there to fix them. During July and August, he was gone from home a lot. Uh, repairing pumps and coils and boilers, boilers and boilers. <laughs> he would even go to, away from home to get a new boiler or a new old boiler and rebuild it. One of the limiting factors of growing mint is you have to have the equipment to distill the oil from the hay that's grown in the field. And that is quite an expensive uh, uh, operation to get involved with. It involves choppers and trucks and uh, the distillery itself, which is uh, constituted with a, a boiler, a big boiler, to generate a lot of steam. Well, this is a commercial mint still, and this piece of equipment is a uh, mint tub. It's used to transport the mint and process the mint. It's connected to a f commercial forage harvester in the field, and while the mint is being chopped, it's blown into this tub through this small door at the top. The mint's chopped into half-inch pieces, so it's fairly fine. And it's a fairly high moisture content when it does that. This tub will hold five to six tons of green chopped mint. On the floor of the tub, there's a manifold. And this manifold has six uh, half-inch pipes connected to it. It runs the length of the floor of the tub. And every 12 inches, there's a hole drilled in it to allow steam to escape. We hook the manifold to a steam line and apply steam. We create the steam with the boiler uh, behind me here. It's just a commercial um, steam boiler, diesel-fired steam boiler, similar to what you'd find in a, to heat a building with or to use in maybe a textile mill or something of that nature. tubs full of mint hay, these wagons full of mint hay, into, into the distillery building. We blow live steam in the bottom of the wagons. This load is just uh, all done cooking. There's no more smell on the steam. And uh, we just opened up the uh, door on the front of the wagon. The steam hose has been unhooked. He's raising the uh, cover, the lid off the wagon. He'll now back a small tractor up, hook onto number seven wagon, and pull it out of the stall. We're using an automatic hitch system on our wagon. Uh, he could just back up, pick up that wagon, pull it out. We have another wagon coming in right in behind us. Uh, 
because this stall was probably only down a minute or a minute and a half. It's sort of amazing the way the steam uh, comes through the load and uh, picks up the oil, you know, in a natural process. So it's, it's a good feeling and we have a lot of fun at it. I am the third generation of Medina uh, to work in the Crosby Fields. This is my grandfather, Natividad Vega Medina Sr., and my grandmother, Romana Barajas Medina. This picture was taken circa 1935. My grandfather just died recently, but uh, my grandmother survived to be a beautiful, strong-spirited, wonderful woman. My family goes back to the early 1920s in St. John's. We migrated from Mexico and through Texas and was the first Mexican-American family to settle in these parts. My family worked for the Crosby family and I uh, am a bricklayer by trade, but when I get out of work, uh, usually most weekdays and on weekends, I enjoy coming out and driving tractor and I, I love to help with the planting and the harvest and, and bottling oils. Uh, it's, it would be hard to describe the feeling that, uh, that you get while working a mint field, uh, especially in this land. It just, it goes back, uh, well, as I said, three generations for me. Let's well, see, I'm uh, third. Uh, my grandfather, my father, and myself, and the boys will be fourth. You know. Your family's been in the mint business for a long time. What generation would you be? Yeah, fourth generation. Well, one of the things that you, you learn uh, coming from a farm, uh, and I think this is across the board, it's just not spearmint and peppermint farming, uh, but I, I believe it's work ethic. And I know that if anything that I've received from my family, uh, and that's it, it's work ethics. Having the responsibility of, of, a, of just knowing what to do and needing to do it. And so I'm very thankful for that. Larry, uh, what generation mint grower are you? I'm third. Could you tell us about the other generations? Well, my grandpa started it a long time ago, as far as I know, in 1914, and went for a while, and dad, my dad took over, and grandpa retired and went up north. And then I started working with dad when I was just a little guy. Because I started driving tractor when I was eight in the field, and I started hauling loads when I was nine or ten. No, I, I never thought that I would really enjoy the farming aspect of it because it, it's so t time consuming in all areas of your life. You don't have a life being coming from a farm. The kids in town, they go to the lake, they go swimming. Uh, when you're on the farm, you've got chores in the morning before you go to school. When you get home from school, uh, your wrestling practice or football, whatever you have, you've got more chores. But other than that, I enjoyed the, the balance and, the, and the, uh, the lifestyle because we had horses, we had all different types of livestock. Uh, I had, you know, I mean, living on the farm was a great lifestyle. Looking back on it, it was priceless. And they always say, well, what, what's that smoke, what's that chimney out there? I said, well, that's our old still. And you get a chance to explain to them what, uh, what you used to do out there. It was, uh, it's, a, it's a heritage. It's, it's a, uh, a memory of uh, my father, my grandfather. And uh, actually, you know, it was a time of families, too. It, a chance to be together even though it was long hours. Well, I'm the third generation and hopefully my, my son will uh, take over and, and be the fourth in, the, in, the, in our family so that we can continue the Crosby history. We'll put it that way. What do you think about it, Jim? I'm going to try, you know, try my best. Uh, it's going to be a long road to, to hoe for me. I'll never be able to you know, come close to what you know, everybody else has done so far. And, uh, but, you know, I'm willing to try and hopefully everything that uh, being around uh, the still for as many years as I have so far, uh, hopefully I picked up something or learned something from I you. hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> Don, I wonder if you could tell me how long you've been a mint farmer. Well, I started in 1936, not my own. But I won't work for a guy, but I've been in it since 1950 myself. Well, there used to be about 11 mint stills in this area, and we're the only ones left. It's the only still left. There's no buildings or nothing.
the number of mint farmers is shrinking every day. Uh, years ago, there would have been more than 1,000. Uh, today, there's probably 600 to 700 mint farmers in the United States. And it's kind of the 80-20 rule. Uh, probably 20% of those control more than 80% of the production of mint. So, uh, and it's a trend in agriculture in general that the farms are getting larger. Well, I think uh, mint is no different than the rest of agriculture, if you look at it. The, the, the move is to better utilize, utilization of capital, which means you've got to have a, a bigger operation to justify the kind of expense you're making in, in terms of uh, equipment. Uh, yes, uh, there is a, uh, a change. Uh, we're talking really larger units uh, under cultivation in, in a given farmer's hands. It probably means uh, the lessening of involvement on the part of the smaller grower. Uh, sad because it's, it's, uh, it was a great way of life. But uh, inevitably to compete in a global marketplace uh, you got to do it efficiently, and efficiency requires uh, bigger plots of acres, uh, better utilization of your capital uh, to compete and keep the, the costs in line with, with what the marketplace is looking for. Most essential oils are produced overseas because of price. I think there is some fear in the mint industry that India and China and Brazil and different countries who produce this material uh, will take over. Um, and, and we know that in the last five or six years, uh, they've really, uh, they've done a good job competing with us. We see more and more foreign paprika uh, moving into our country than ever before. We also see um, a bigger crop of American peppermint than we've ever seen before. This year it it's, was too big and the, the markets have gone down for the farmer. A very tough it's been a very tough market for the U.S. farmers. They're, uh, 1999, the farmers are dealing with uh, a dramatic oversupply situation uh, in the U.S. growing base. They're also dealing from, with stiff competition from India and China, which has been ever-growing in the last five, six years. For many years, although it's been somewhat um, cyclical in its, in its price back to the grower, it's been a dependable crop as far as an income. Um, currently, it's it's not doing well price-wise, as is the case with many other crops right now. So it's going to have to maintain the mantle of quality while at the same time work hard on ways to drive down uh, its costs of production, which it's a, it's a delicate and difficult balance to achieve. Um, but today I would say, yes, it does have a future. I think that we'll continue to grow more pepperito oil than, than uh, the other countries because you still have to have a good quality product to produce a pro good quality product. And um, we don't feel that, that our foreign competitors are, are able to produce a quality that is uh, worldwide accepted. It's a uh, small crop from a total acreage base and yet um, a very high value crop. Um, one of the things that I've noticed in my short time with the Lehman Company is the mint farmers tend to be the highest quality farmer uh, out there. I find working with mint to be by far my favorite crop. It's really a very enjoyable crop. It's, uh, it's finicky, it's difficult. Um, no two fields behave the same and it's a challenge always. I've worked with mint for about a dozen years now and I probably have less confidence now than when I started because I know now what I don't know. Um, and I wouldn't trade it for anything, and I sincerely hope that we can keep growing mint, that the price will come back, and we can keep growing mint, because I like to work with it. It's, it's like a grain crop. When you start harvesting grain, you see the grain come out, you sort of know that you grew it and, and helped produce it. So it's, it's a good feeling. It's the feeling a farmer has, I guess, when he gets his roots there, you know. My grandfather started it, my father picked it up, and then I picked it up from him, so third generation I am and my boys will be the fourth. So I hope we can continue that for a few years depending on the prices and the demand for the oil. We see generation after generation uh, in the past that's really loved this business of farming and um, 
nowadays we see more of the decisions in farming done by corporate type farms uh, based strictly on the bottom line whereas um, the, the family farmer has been in it for the love of farming and it, it's a shame to, to think that that might be uh, a way of the past you know 20 30 years from now it might be all in the hands of the corporate farmers well history is out there and you know I've been in this 20 years with the company and uh, I see the buildings falling down and if you don't take a picture that building is it's gone and uh, it all you have is uh, the memory in your mind and unless you have an actual photo uh, you can't show nobody I started running this in in uh, 1948 when we changed over to the new new type of uh, wagons and uh, so that was a, a really a big thrill for me because I was fresh out of high school 1948 and dad uh, broke me into firing this and keeping the still going while uh, he chopped the loads in the field so so this is uh, since 1948 and this is 1998 this is my 50th 50th year of uh, running the boiler or it will be I would love to get this little still going again uh, hopefully someday it might if my my children are got enough gumption and <laughs> can find enough money to to get it going why we'd, we'd love to do that As a matter of fact I I came up to this and uh, uh, open the doors up with my sister and, and I just sit there imagined uh, when my dad was a kid and was shoveling coal because the, the, the coal pile was right back here and uh, putting everything through and it's just a uh, you know just that era just fascinates me you know because this is where it started for for me anyways and uh, I can remember feeling the heat watching when, when dad would open the hopper doors and you can see the flames of, from the coal uh, just kind of you want to stare at that. Uh, my grandfather had a wicker chair that he'd sit in and and uh, you'd kind of take that I'd sit in there and read comic books you know and then uh, I thought it was a big thing they let me get up on the wagon and would uh, clamp clamp the lids you know when I was finally strong enough to be able to clamp that down. I probably hung around and probably caused some more trouble than I did help for a while but uh, any chance you could get there in stilling time would you'd run out there and try to stay, be by the still. We'd like to make this a, a historical site. We, we want to keep the property. Uh, the building was just about ready to fall down, and my mother says, well, boys, we, we got to get, gotta get a roof on that building. We don't wanna, want it to go down and lose our, our history. So she went ahead and arranged to put the uh, roof on it, and she was very pleased to see it all done before she died. So she'd be proud, and she'd be proud of the, the, uh, all the history that's going on in Michigan to be brought back. There's a lot of history in, in, uh, in Michigan over the uh, in industry. Well, what I have here is a rope uh, connected to our still whistle. Uh, it's actually an old, old locomotive whistle that we use every year. Uh, traditionally in the olden days, if the still had a whistle, it was uh, a way to communicate, break for lunch. Uh, when the still got steam up in the morning, it would blow the whistle. It would tell the field worker, people in the field, that uh, they're ready for a load. The still was ready for a load. And uh, also in case of emergencies, uh, the, the whistle was used quite frequently. Uh, that was a sign there was an emergency and that was for everybody to come to the still and to see what the, the emer emergency was.